Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and today, well, today, I'm in virtual reality. I'm in the middle of Gale Crater on Mars. Now, Gale Crater is a 150 kilometer wide crater where, well, the Mars Science Laboratory landed a few years ago, and it's been slowly but surely making its way towards this mountain over here. This is called Aeolus Mons. It's a mountain in the middle of the crater. It's also known colloquially as uh, Mount Sharp, I believe. And so yeah, this is something called Valve Destinations. And it's a really interesting toolkit that's uh, been thrown out to like VR developers. Uh, it's essentially a way of building, or it's essentially a way of rendering real world environments that have been reconstructed with, um, you know, fo out of photographs. So it's a process called photogrammetry where you can essentially reconstruct three-dimensional models using camera uh, images. So uh, what, what I can do is I can walk around, I can teleport, and I've teleported here and I can read little uh, notes about how the surface atmospheric pressure on Mars is typically about 0.6 that of, of Earth. This atmosphere, mostly comprised of carbon dioxide, may be extremely thin but its winds are still enough to form these sand dunes from the fine Martian dust. And yeah, if I click, so I can go anywhere. Uh, because of the way that VR tends to make people sick, uh, motion sickness, you can uh, you teleport around and that tends to help with that. The Curiosity rover reached this region in the autumn of 2014 before spending more than a year circling the area you're exploring getting an overview before more thoroughly investigating geological features of particular scientific interest. Yeah, and of course you can see all these tracks for the rover. You can also see, by the way, the edges of the space appear as I start to move towards it. That's because there's a desk there or something, so it's warning me. I can move around a little, I can step back and forth, but if I uh, end up bumping into the side, bad things could happen. I can also get down close and take a look and see that there is actually a certain degree of uh, three-dimensionalness to this, right? So just using the controller there. But uh, obviously, we're not getting... Well, I guess that is actually... You can see that that, is, that little rock is actually rendered in 3D here. So yeah, this is constructed from 3D data. And if I look around, I can perhaps find a sign which will explain this. And I'm gonna to have to guess, it's not there, so let's just take a little step. That's Book Cliffs. I'm just gonna go past this right now. I think this might be it. Oh, and it's right here, but it won't lock on. Ah, image glitches. So this explains how this terrain was constructed. The 3D terrain model shown here was built from close to a thousand monochrome navigation camera issue, in, images from the Mars rover. If there are holes or patches of blurriness in what you see, it is because we have no better aligned navcam data to describe that area. And I can turn on the camera positions and you can see them rendered in the sky here. Basically, these are the camera positions that they use to construct this scene. The, uh, const the color it comes from other images, other color images. The navcam data was generally uh, monochrome, but uh, the artists were able to fill in the rest of the data using all this. So you can see, for example, this is where the, uh, the vehicle stopped and then it rotated its camera and made a scan of the area. And you can see a number of places where they have done this. So if I uh, take a look around, I'm gonna step back to this one here. This is called Book Cliffs. Features on Mars can be given unexpected names, such as these cliffs just centimetres high. One of a number of outcrops showing ancient sedimentary layers, the rover drift, drilled, sampled, and intensively analysed these rocks, sending back data to scientists on Earth. So yeah, you can see these little uh, cliffs here. I'm just going to move away so you can see this outcrop and the structure that was behind it. Okay. So actually, I should probably step back to this rover image here, right here, and turn this off because you don't want to be seeing these camera reference points all the time. Let's actually take a step over and take a look at the rover itself. This is it. So one of the amazing things about this whole VR thing is, of course, it's room scale, and I'm seeing this 
for someone my height, so I'm six foot tall, you can see the Rover is actually quite big. It's a 900 kilogram vehicle. It's the size of a car and I've moved right in here and standing in front of it, I can see a lot of the business end of the vehicle here. So up, up here, this is your mast cam and you have two navigation cameras on either side. I believe one, there are different fields of view. Up on top, this is the chem cam. So this is a chemical analysis device that basically fires a laser and the laser generates a little puff of plasma and then there's a telescope there that collects the, the light that comes off that plasma and then tries to figure out what chemicals were being vaporized and therefore gets an idea of what kind of chemistry the rocks have. Uh, if I just move around here. So yeah, you've got navigation cameras on the front. These aren't that interesting. You have a robot arm here. Now the robot arm has a head on it which has a lot of scientific instruments. And I'm going to step back because what I'm going to do is if I take a step backwards and then due to the magic of room scale VR, I can actually step right in really close and get a closer look at this. So on top of this, you have, I think, five different uh, attachments. This whole head will come down to the surface and then it will rotate to yeah, basically put the correct instrument in place. So the obvious one here is the drill, right? So this is the drill. This will do a lot of uh, drilling into rocks. You can see the probes that are used to make sure that it drills the correct depth and everything. That's most of the motor here. Here is what's called the dust abrasion device or something. It's basically some brushes, right? They're going to brush some dust out of the way so that they can expose more information. And this, which I've been putting my neck right up against, apparently, being stupid, like I'm going to put my head right up against it. Ah! Uh, that is the alpha particle X-ray spectrometer. So what this device does is it has a little radiation source in here called, uh, it's made of an element called curium, which is emitting alpha particles, and these come out, and whatever is close to it gets irradiated, and then the irradiation will, of course, excite the elements, and it will emit x-rays, and then there's an x-ray spectrometer, which will detect the x-rays coming off, and then, of course, be able to classify the material based upon what is emitted. So, you know, that's held up against a rock for a certain amount of time and then they observe the spectra coming back and they get some idea of the chemistry that's going on there. Now, over here, this little chunk, this is uh, essentially a device that picks up dust uh, that is generated by the drill and it, you know, it will process it and prepare it. It'll scoop it up, prepare it, and then it can drop it into these various devices, which are different chemical processing systems and I don't remember exactly what goes on in all of these ones but one of them I know is uh, like a, a, an x-ray an x-ray crystallography experiment where they basically fire x-rays through it and then the diffraction patterns that it generates gives you an idea of the crystalline structure and therefore what kind of uh, elements, what kind of chemistry and everything you have there. So it's of course very, very useful. The other ones, uh, they similarly do similar kinds of, you know, mass spectroscopy where they you know, heat up an element or heat up the material and then uh, ionize it and shoot it through a magnetic field. And then you get an idea of the atomic mass spectra and things like this. So this final instrument here, number five, is essentially a microscope. I think it's called the Mars uh, handheld image. Magnif I don't know, handheld imager. The idea is it's a microscope. It zooms in really close and lets you take a look at the fine structure of the materials on the surface. And to calibrate this thing, there's actually a funny thing here. To calibrate this thing, down here, they have a little calibration chart. Now, obviously, you have different colors here along the top, and then there's a, a grid structure here, I think, that's used to determine resolution. And right at the bottom, this brown circle, which is completely indistinct in VR, but I know for a fact that that is a 1908 one cent piece, uh, one cent coin. Uh, and that's, you know, I guess it's a kind of nod to a geologist's standard practice of including things for scale. So having a coin on there, and not just that, but a vintage coin. I think, I think 1908 was the first year that they minted uh, Abraham Lincoln one cent coins. 
So, you know, someone from the team picked that out and made a point to include it, send it all the way to Mars. So that that may well be the first currency that ever made it to Mars. Yes, Mars is now a capitalist society and the Mars Science Rover has all the money on Mars. Uh, it also has a lot of plutonium. If I come around the back here, we can get another idea of what's going on. You can see the suspension and everything here. You notice the wheels. There's motors in all of these wheels here. The front and the rear ones are the only ones that have steering. These ones don't have steering, obviously. You can see, oh, the middle ones don't have any steering. Um, on the back here, you can see there's transmitters. So that little, uh, you know, cylindrical coffee pot shaped one, that is the one which talks to satellites in orbit, right? They talk to spacecraft in orbit and they can actually get megabits of data to the spacecraft in orbit which have you know big science uh, you know transmitter dishes big radio transmitters and they can send the data back to earth way faster but it can also use this little one here which is a directional uh, high gain antenna it can put, talk directly to earth but i think it's limited to something like 32 kilobits of data per second so if i step around the back here yes this is the radio thermal generator. I'm going to actually just, again, use the power of room scale to take a look and irradiate myself. Oh, it's burning my chest! Okay, that doesn't quite work. Yeah, don't ever do that in reality, obviously. I'm pretty sure there's some rule that says if you ever dig up a radio thermal isotope generator, that you have to play some Donna Summer and dance to it. I've got to get some hot stuff into my chest. Oh, yeah, oh, no. okay, forget about the science. It's very hard being a disembodied head, I'm sure you're imagining. I'm trying to move my head as slowly as possible, and it's very hard because, of course, I'm talking at the same time. So, yeah, actually, let's take a look at some of the other sites. So, yeah, this is a view to Mount Sharp, officially named Aeolus Mons. It is a mountain. Essentially, it's a, yeah, it is a mountain. But it's at the middle of the crater, so it's been created by the crater-making process where it's kind of bounced back. It's about 15,000, 16,000 feet high, 5.5 kilometers. The crater itself is about 154 kilometers across. So yeah, we have the Mars Science Laboratory, we have some other bits and pieces here, and we have a dog that's just run by my leg, confusing me. <laughs> there we go. So... Whale rock. This rocky outcrop shows cross bedding resulting from water passing over a loose bed of sediment. These layers are thought to have formed over 3 billion years ago around an ancient lake and have slowly been exposed again by erosion. So you can get an idea of the structures. And once again, I'm going to get low down just so I can see the kind of shape of everything here. It's really, really fun. I mean, you know, you get the idea that doing this, that Robots can do a lot of what we people do, but actually getting in there and looking at it in this way, just, it's like a transformative use of the data. It's fantastic. I mean, I am no geologist by any means. I, you know, barely got through. Oh, there's a big patch in the data there. Uh oh, that looks like quicksand. Yeah, it's just a glitch in the data. A glitch in the matrix. Exit. The rover left this region in early 2015, moving at a typical top speed of just 30 meters per hour. It was already close to completing its first 10 kilometers. So I guess 30 meters per hour means, wow, 30 meters per hour, you could get, you know, over a kilometer every couple of days. That's quite impressive, actually. So you can actually see, if I stand up here, that we're kind of going downhill. There's the rover. I'm just going to take little steps watch it move by and then from down here we're looking back up at the rover going uphill a little if we can go all the way over here i mean there's a bunch of other things that i can no doubt look at but let's try and get right here yeah there's a, a little bit of a hill and it's it's much more obvious when i'm looking at it in vr yeah this really is fantastic the sky is procedurally generated it's not a real sky. They just took photos of Martian clouds and then applied those themselves. So yeah, this is called Valve Destinations and it's not the only thing that's in this. I mean, there's a whole workshop set. There's an English church you can go to, which again was created using photogrammetry where they take a lot of images and they construct 
a 3D model of everything. So this is a bunch of photos were used to construct a church in, uh, in England. And there we go here. We can walk along the path. We can see bits and pieces. You can also see some interesting glitches. Like if you look in here up at the ceiling, you can see there's patches that we didn't get data for. So they just, they don't have any way to fill them in. Similarly, there's a patch behind this gravestone because they, you can see from this line here, they must have had a camera taking a picture up here and they must have had a camera about here taking a picture, but they didn't have one right there. So they don't know what's in behind that gravestone. So it's all hidden away. This is, I mean, it's really kind of interesting to see all this. And there's a, all these information points that actually talk about the process by which they do this. I'm not going to go into this because it's only of marginal interest to a lot of you. You can also see the trees are kind of rendered there, but there's weird glitches where branches are kind of half there and half not there. The birds, the birds are added in afterwards. They're not real. <laughs> and you can see the church from behind. Also, uh, other examples is, say, a little mech, which is scanned from a 3D scan again from a model here. This is a plastic model. Cyber Trooper MBV Tim whatever. Nice, nice stuff nevertheless. Ooh, look at that chest plate. That is quite interesting. And uh, yeah, you also have the Atlas demo scene, which lets you uh, get familiar with some of the robot characters from the multiplayer or the two-player collaborative version of Portal 2. Aperture Laboratories, big hole in the back there. Check batteries weekly. Yeah. Oh, and yes, giant one. Hello. Yeah, you barely fit in there, don't you? So yeah, I, I just this is me just messing around here. But the Mars one, it was definitely a transformative moment for me. You can there's a whole workshop where people are adding bits and pieces, and you can download their own. I'll be really interested to see if people do anything more on this subject. But uh, yeah, check it out. Valve Destinations, it's for those people with HTC Vive headsets. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.